Peter, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you today? Great. Awesome. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for taking the time. And where in the world are you today? In Los Angeles. Very good. Very good. In paradise. In paradise. You know, I. It's it's so funny. I'm in Austin, Texas, and you know the, the mm. you know Los Angeles is not too bad during winters, but it's a little chilly here. Yesterday was t-shirt weather and shorts and t-shirts. Today it's 31 degrees, 32 degrees, somewhere hovering around, you know, freezing point. But that's the that's winter for Austin, Texas. You know, it's just like mm. you you get about every four or five days you get a lot of you know uh, t-shirt weather and uh, shorts weather, if you will. So Peter, why don't we get right into it? Thanks so much for taking the time. Kick us off by telling us your story, and you're such an accomplished individual. And I would love to love for you to explore all the different facets of things that you've done. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, I started out as an electronics engineer and um, started my own company. And then I fell in love with software. And so my company very quickly changed into a software company or solutions company, really. So I developed an ERP software package and uh, quite a comprehensive package for mid-sized business. And the company grew quite nicely from the garage to 400 people and we did an IPO. So that, that was super exciting. Awesome. Love to do that again. <laughs> awesome. And uh, it's really when I exited that, uh, that company that I had enough time on my hands to, to say what big project do I really want to tackle next? And what struck me is how dumb software really is, you know, that it, you know, has no common sense. And if the programmer didn't think of a particular condition, it'll just give you an error message or crash or something, you know, and they can't learn and they can't reason. So how can we, how can we uh, bring intelligence into software? And so I embarked on a, a five-year program mission really to deeply understand what intelligence is from many different aspects from uh, epistemology theory of knowledge you know how do we know anything what is reality you know sort of really the the, the core foundations of, of of understanding intelligence and then how children learn how our intelligence differs from animal intelligence you know what makes human intelligence so different and powerful uh, what do IQ tests measure measure and all the work that had been done in the field of AI to, to really synthesize that so the culmination of that was for me to come up with a design for a thinking learning engine. Um, and I then in 2001 coined the term uh, AGI together with two other people. We wrote a book on the topic and I started an R&D company to turn my design into actual various prototypes and experiment and um, 2008, we then commercialized this, the, the first version of it, and um, sort of been alternating between development and commercialization. And we are now in the sort of second major generation of this technology in Igo.ai, where we are offering a chatbot with a brain, as opposed to all of the other chatbots out there that don't have a brain. That is just such a fascinating. There's so many different places I want to go in that in that description. But what a fascinating background, and uh, what an honor for me to be on the same uh, call or in the same room with you, uh, mm. the person who uh, collectively invented the term AGI. Mm. I mean, um, you know, definitely one one set of folks who really took that to heart and took it seriously was definitely Hollywood as you can imagine, because they just popularized it, made it part of pop, pop culture. But, you know, start, start from the beginning there in terms of when you did all this exploration on trying to get deeper into what does intelligence mean and what is unique about human intelligence versus, you know, animal intelligence and other things, what did you find out? I mean, give us, give me a, a quick summary, if you don't mind. Uh, what was the key findings here? Right. So there, there are a couple of key points. Um, one of them that makes human intelligence unique is that we are able to form abstract concepts. So animals can only form concrete based concepts. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a total dividing line. Obviously, there is some continuity, but 
to 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 simplify it, you know, an animal, uh, you know, a dog could rec- can categorize basically, you know, a tree or a food bowl or a fire hydrant or you know yeah. a cat or whatever. But these are perceptual. Uh, these concepts are formed directly from perception, things they can perceive in some way. Now, um, evolution has uh, basically allowed us to utilize those same mechanisms recursively that we can now form concepts of concepts so we can build a hierarchy of concepts that can become extremely abstract you know such things as liberty or loyalty or marriage or yeah. government or, or whatever uh, which are many levels removed from the sort of the, the concrete perceptual reality and and that's one of the key differences we also have metacognition um that is sort of we can reason we are aware of our thinking and um in fact one of the biggest uh, one of the things i i spent a year working on um an a new type of iq test it's not really an iq test but a cognitive ability test and uh, what i learned there is that metacognition is actually a very key part of how smart a person is. And that is, do they use the right strategy for problem solving? Because different problems require different approaches. And if you have good metacognition of that type, then uh, you would tend to not get stuck using the, the wrong Tech, uh, technique to solve a particular problem. You have you'd have that awareness explicitly or uh, implicitly. Um, so th- those are some of the um, key insights. And then in the field of AI, what I realized um, is that, and and why we coined the term uh, artificial general intelligence, is that really what AI has been doing for the last many decades is not really what the original idea of AI was all about, to build thinking machines. What we've been doing for the last few decades is narrow AI. And there's actually a, an extremely important point here that narrow AI um, is really using the programmer's intelligence or the data scientist's intelligence to solve the problem, the, the narrow problem you've identified. So, for example, you know, it, going back to good old fashioned AI, um, a, a deep blue IBM's, you know, world chess champion uh, computer. Uh, it was really the engineers that figured out how to use a computer to solve this problem of playing a really good game of chess. It wasn't that they built a ma- machine that could figure it out. Sure. And even now with, um, you know, deep learning, machine learning, it's still the data scientist that figures out what data do I need to use? How do I scrub the data? How to pre-process it? Uh, what architecture do I use? And it's their intelligence that really solves the problem on how to put together these different techniques. But what you really want ultimately, what the original dream of, of the, the founders of the field of AI had 60 odd years ago, was to build a thinking learning machine, a machine that it can learn and think and reason and figure out how to solve these different problems. And that's what AG, what really what AGI is. So there's really, it's day and night between what almost everybody in the field of AI is doing, which is narrow AI, and they're using their intelligence to solve a particular problem. It's just pure automation. Versus, yeah. build, versus building a thinking machine that can ultimately learn and reason. That's, you know, it's fascinating. You know, there's a few things that you, you, you called out there that I want to explore further. One is the fact that, like, you know, what you're really doing in almost all of the narrow AI intelligence, you know, the, the current version of AI, what we've been doing for decades now, is capturing the intelligence or the problem-solving methodologies and stuff of the human being who's working on the problem and automating it through algorithms, right? Whereas what you're saying is the approach of... of the, how AGI came about was about how do you really build a system that can independently think and solve those problems and learn from the results and then get better over time, right? Um, don't you think, you know, though, so one one uh, clarification or, or a question I have there is, don't you think in the, in, in, even within narrow AI, an algorithm that looks at input, uh, historic sets of inputs and outputs, 
and decides to understand that what features contributed to what and what is the kind of shape of the output and then giving you that particular output. Isn't that in a narrow set of way exactly doing that, but just with some human telling it what to do? I mean, isn't that also part of the spectrum? Um, well, uh, no. I mean, first of all, they don't understand anything. These systems don't understand anything. So I think be abusing the the word understanding um, – well, actually, I've, I wrote an article called Understanding Understanding, uh, where, you know, there's a very shallow way you could say a system understands. And if you say, for example, uh, Alexa, close the blinds, and Alexa does the right thing, then in a very shallow level, you can say Alexa understood. Yeah. But that's only in terms of that whatever your utterance, the sound waves you put into the microphone triggered the routine to close the blinds yeah. thing exactly. but you couldn't ask alexa anything about blinds or closing or or, or, or you know understanding so it's a it's extremely shallow um interpretation of of the word understanding um you know which is the first level obviously is to to say do you react properly to whatever input you Perhaps, get yeah. understanding but there's no deep understanding there is no reasoning and also, the, the way the system learns, it doesn't learn interactively uh, in the real world. You know, there are massive amounts of data that you basically number crunch, you have back propagation. And um, it's, you know, it's, I mean, you show a child a single picture of a giraffe. They've never seen a giraffe before. The child will be able to recognize a giraffe in different colors, upside down, you know, and baby giraffe and, and so on without without any difficulty. Um, so that that is, an, you know, there a couple of – one of the starting points, I think, in building intelligent systems is to say what are the core requirements of intelligence. And, uh, again, I have an article on that. And you can list them and, and say, you know, human-like intelligence. Um, you need to be able to learn – Immediately, you know, interactively, one shot learning, zero shot learning, you know, thinking about it. And you need to be able to do that uh, with limited resources in a noisy environment. So you need to be able to disambiguate or ask for clarification, you know, so there could be contradictory information, it might be incomplete, it might be wrong information. You need to be able to take that in and, and then say, well, this contradicts something I already know, mm -hmm. or I'm missing some piece of information. And you can't put that into a number crunching type of thing that runs for 48 hours and uses uses electricity of, you know, of Manhattan, <laughs> Manhattan <laughs> yeah. volume of electricity to to learn something. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but still, uh, intelligence requires a couple of things like that: the ability to to learn, the ability to understand something deeply, um, and the ability to reason about things. And I think it's generally accepted that deep learning, machine learning systems uh, do do not have the ability to reason. Um, and you know that that sort of, but they also don't learn interactively and 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 you know know what they know what they're learning. Fine, that's that's great actually. You know, so on that topic, Peter, um, explore that a little bit more on the why. Why do we need machines that can understand? Right? What's the holy grail? Are we trying to? I mean, is it a desirable thing to create things that are more human-like? in the way they understand the world and perform actions. Explore that for me a little bit. Why is AGI, why yeah. is understanding machines important? Right. So a couple of reasons. First of all, with narrow AI, narrow AI is dangerous because it's dumb. You know, I mean, if you have self-driving car that doesn't have human level understanding, it's likely to make bad mistakes at some point. And that's true for whatever technology that's in a critical path. Um, and, you know, I mean, some of the problems we have with Alexa, for example, um, you know, a few years ago, there was this thing where, um, uh, what was it again? Alexa shared some information that it, it yeah. shouldn't, you know, and, and so on. But it, it was really a failure of intelligence um, that that caused the problem. So I think the the the, the first thing is to make uh, 
AI safer and more capable. I mean, you look at chatbots, you know, our company provides a chatbot with a brain. That's how we describe it. Now, currently, all other chatbots out there don't have a brain. And I mean, you know, we we experience it every time we interact with a chatbot, an automated system, sure. uh, or an, an IVR. They're terrible. They're they terrible. Are, but so you want so- more. In, you want more intelligence. <laughs> no, no. But I think let me is that let me let me challenge you a little bit on that, Peter, because dog versus human being, right? Right now, right? Hmm. Uh, or any animal versus human being. If you ask me who is more dangerous today, <laughs> I would say an overthinking human being who's got wrong intentions is way more dangerous than a puppy or a dog, you know, who's mm-hmm. got not that kind of generalized level of intelligence. So won't that same thing mm-hmm. apply here? We're saying you're, you're actually making an argument, which is I find it very fascinating that narrow AI is dumb and therefore more dangerous. How can, mm-hmm. you know, explore that for me? Sorry. I mean, can yeah. intelligence mean more? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can we can certainly go there. And I, I uh, actually let me just finish on why we want uh, why we want smart smart systems, and I'll come back uh, to that. So, uh, so yes, first of all, we want uh, we want systems that are simply better at doing their job, much better than sure. doing their job, and for that they need high levels of intelligence. Um, but the, the other thing is we ultimately want AI to help us solve the problems in the world that are too hard for us to solve. So, I mean, if you look at, you know, producing nanotechnology, you know, clean energy, if, you know, look look at pollution, look at uh, poverty, look at, um, you know, diseases, aging, uh, look at governance in particular, I think civilization has got to a point where we're not really smart enough to actually even manage our own lives, you know, in, in a global sense in terms of, I mean, governments are generally a, a mess. So we need to apply more intelligence to help us solve these these problems of advanced civilization. And that's why I think we, it's, it's almost, you know, it's almost a question that we need AI to save ourselves from ourselves. Um <laughs> So I think there's a good argument to be made. But even if you if if you don't believe that, just imagine training one AGI with to be a a cancer researcher, PhD level cancer researcher. Um, now you can make a million copies of that AGI, and you have a million AGI, you have a million cancer researchers chipping away at this problem in parallel without their egos getting in the way, communi- communicating, sharing what they're finding freely. How, how quickly do you think we'll make progress in, in, in cancer? I mean, it, it'll be, you know, phenomenal yeah. to, to, have that kind of, to have that kind of power. So, yeah, I think there, uh, all the reasons in the world of why we want uh, more intelligence in our AI but getting to, you know getting to as you say a, a, a human with bad intentions can can do a lot of damage uh, more than an animal yes true um, but a human with good intentions can also do a lot more good than than a dog or a cat can can do sure. so why would we build agis with bad intentions you know nobody's really ever explained that to, uh, to me or you know if commercially you are building a system that must help humans now there, there may be some fraction of 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 people that want to abuse ai in some way but it's always going to be important that we have more good guys than bad guys i mean if you know but that's a, that's a general problem in 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 civilization you know you have more Cops and robbers, you know, or, or the, yeah. <laughs> the cops are better than the robbers. Um, so, but there's every reason to believe that that'll be the case because may, most AGIs will be built uh, to help humanity. But there's there's actually an even much more important point. A lot of bad people or people that do bad things that we, you know, call them immoral or call them just bad or call them stupid, whichever. But let's say things that are negative for humanity or negative for the individual. There are are three key reasons for that it happens. I mean, there are more than three, but I'd like to uh, highlight three of them. And we could take 9-11 as an example uh, for for that. So 
people react emotionally, react, react out of fear. And we don't necessarily make the smartest decisions when we re react out of fear. The second thing is we act with not enough information. We're not very good at getting clear information. You know, uh, it's easier to just get whatever you first see on Facebook or on, on your, whatever news channel you happen to yep. turn, turn on to. So we work with very limited information, not very objective uh, objective. Uh, you know, selection of information. And and thirdly, we are not actually very good at reasoning. Human, it, the evolution didn't develop our brains to be rational thinkers. You know, that that's sort of, a, we're trying to achieve that with our training and schooling and, and, you know, and so on. But we're inherently not very good. There are all sorts of fallacies we fall into. Now, an AI isn't going to suffer from any of those. It's not going to react out of fear it's going to have much better information available to it sure. and it's going to be much, much better at rational thought. So it'll actually be able to give us good advice that will avoid us making many of the mistakes that we currently make in, in, in the world that are detrimental to human flourishing. So intelligence is a positive force to human flourishing. Absolutely. No, don't disagree at all. Actually, I think there might even be... Um... You know, maybe I was a little confused, even in the way that we, you know, the way you define AGI versus well, how honestly hmm. Hollywood has defined AGI for everybody else, right? Which is like the overarching intelligent, super intelligent beings and systems that can completely act and live in their own, right? What you're saying is, is you're basically talking about AI, AI systems that can understand really recent can dynamically interact with the user, can learn from those interactions mm -hmm. and make, you know, overarching better decisions because you're now uh, computing at a higher level of intelligence, if you will, right? So that's, I think- C Correct. Right? I think that's that that that's one thing that, you know, even when we started the conversation versus now, I think it's, it's mm -hmm. very clear to me right now. The other part of that, and then I love the way you actually called it out in terms of saying, look, you know, we want systems that are better at doing their jobs. AI has to solve these bigger problems to advance civilization. And, you know, um, and I love the example that you gave about, you know, ha imagine having a cancer researcher, right? Now, in the truest sense of the, the public definition of AGI and how everybody's like Skynet and stuff like that, a cancer researcher would be a really good multimodal narrow AI that does everything associated with cancer research can actually do understand from different sources of data. They're not like narrow, just like a, they're not a single, an ensemble of machine learning models that'll just perform a mm. task, right? Uh, so I think it, it makes a, makes total sense from the way you describe it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we we don't want to, we definitely don't want to call it a narrow AI because narrow AI is, is a different category. You could have taught that AI to be uh, a researcher in nanotechnology or to be a school teacher or to be a whatever, you know, administrator. So they are specialists, you know, they are, have specialized in, in a particular area, which makes sense because uh, clearly you want to pursue a particular goal and accumulate knowledge in the okay. particular area you, you, you're working on. Um, but yeah, you, you also, you know, you, you point out what we sort of, how we see AGI in terms of Hollywood portrays. It's very unfortunate that uh, it makes for a much better story to um, to basically have a, an evil AI. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, that's just the way it is. And then, of course, the way they are evil is that they have, they, you know, they, they have the, the same um, sort of the most negative attributes of humans, you know, that they have, which is actually totally unrealistic. I mean, the reason humans are uh, are bad, uh, or main reasons, are, is really our reptile brain. You know, I mean, we we still have to fight the urge to rape and pillage. Basically, you know, it's it's about you know survival and reproduction. I mean, that's you know that's our animal heritage. So it's it's when those reptile brain things really you know Before. cannot be controlled by our by rational thought and and by civilization that we do bad things now in an agi there's absolutely no reason why you'd want to give it that kind of reptile brain 
uh, motivation to you know to rape and pillage you know to to basically um uh, yeah be uh, all about survival and reproduction i mean yeah. no it we don't make any build sense AGIs do that like that why would we want to exactly well of course you 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 do get into the as nick bostrom calls it the the danger of these machines starting to build developing will and building systems that they can decide what needs to go in there and that becomes more intelligent systems the, the, the era of super yeah. intelligence right yeah, so what they mainly talk about is what they call the alignment problem. And, you know, Nick, Nick Bostrom is extremely smart guy. He's extremely good at debating. He's very persuasive, um, but he's wrong. <laughs> um, the problem is all the money that's flowing to um, AI ethics research only goes to the researchers who say, we have a big problem. If you give us money, we'll help figure right. out how we can You're trying do, do that. To Nobody's going to give anybody money who says, uh, no, there isn't there a problem. <laughs> and I, I will, you know, I will write a book about that and I will have an organization that can argue against that. The alignment problem, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think many, many of your listeners will probably know one of the things is a sort of paper a paperclip optimizer example that was originally given for this alignment problem. And that is you tell an AGI, I need paperclips. I want lots of paperclips. And <clears throat> basically the, the, the AGI then turns the universe into paperclips paper because clip. it yeah. becomes, it's really wow. good at that. Okay. Now, yes, it's an absurd example, but the same argument applies to less absurd examples. It's basically you're postulating that the AGI is so smart that it can overcome all the defenses of humanity, of other AIs. It it's basically can, yeah, no other AI can stop it. No human can stop it. It's going to turn the, the whole universe into paper clips. It's that smart. And yet it's so stupid that it doesn't actually ask you, well, okay, when do you want me to stop making paper clips? Or why do you actually want them? You know? Are you trying to corner the market that you can now sell a paper clip for ten dollars each, or you know, and then it might explain to you why that's not even a good, particularly good plan. You know, that is the that so, is that is definitely the flaw in the argument, as you call out, right? Saying you, yeah. know, you expect the system to be so smart to understand whatever it takes, it's going to make paper clips, but on the same mm -hmm. uh, time, won't ask the question, why are we making paper clips and so many paper clips, right? Right. Um, so that alignment, <clears throat> that alignment on on ethics and that uh, has to happen automatically as the system interacts with you. It can't do a good job. Uh, I mean, let me take a really pedestrian example here. <clears throat> One of our big customers is One Eight Hundred Flowers, and we provide an intelligent concierge uh, bot to help people with their gifts. You know, you might uh, you might uh, buy gifts for your family, your, your aunt, your business partners or whatever, you buy different gifts for different people, for different occasions at different times. Now, we would pre-program the system or pre-train it really rather than program it, pre-train it with the sort of default behaviors and things that people have. But if you want the system to be really useful to the individual, you need to learn, you need to understand that individual, yeah. you know, why are they buying it? What is the motivation? And, you know, what happened? Now you, you're buying something for a funeral. Okay, that person has passed away. So you probably don't want to offer the birthday gift for that person next year. <laughs> you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, so you need to align. The, the, an intelligence system needs to understand your motivations, your desires, your goals, and why you have them. And the more intelligent it is, the deeper that understanding, uh, you would expect that understanding to be deeper and deeper and more and more aligned. Now, the AI would hopefully also point out to you that maybe some of your values are detrimental to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that they, they're not values in the long run. They may only be values in the short run. Got it. No, that's a fascinating example. Actually, um, Reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, uh, Jana Eggers of uh, Neurologix, who they're also they you know it's a, they started with a, I think one of their founders had a GoFi background, symbolic logic background as well. They're also trying to capture the mm -hmm. essence of it. In fact, one of my 
critiques of the market today, uh, Peter, and I'm pretty sure you agree that we have swung the pendulum a little too much into data-driven machine learning, right? We started off mm-hmm. with, you know, GoFi and symbolic logic and being able to capture the human essence as rules so systems can do it. While it wasn't intelligent systems, it at least captured the human knowledge. Versus now, we have gone swung the pendulum to the other side to say, don't worry about the human knowledge here. Don't worry about context. Just here's the data of historic Mm -hmm. events. Just learn from it and apply you this thing. And there's no common sense anymore, right? And so I think that the world, you know, I'm sure you're you're also arguing for it with AGI, with with your definition of AGI. I think the world, the, the reality is the AI needs to be somewhere in the middle ground, needs to learn enough from data, but we have the ability to reason, to understand, and then make decisions, better decisions, right? Um, fascinating. Yes, there are, are certainly uh, increasing number of uh, machine learning experts that are talking about what do we need to do to make our systems more intelligent. And they're starting to talk about integrating uh, reasoning systems and so on. Um, I, I believe that's still not going to get us anywhere. And I, I say for the following reason, um, in fact, there's a good explanation, uh, a good model that I think DARPA presented a few years ago, what they call the three waves of AI. Um, and uh, again, I've got articles on that if anybody's interested on uh, medium.com or from our website. Um, sure. And the first wave is good old fashioned AI. Mm-hmm. So that's what we had for decades. The second wave is a tsunami that hit us, deep learning, machine learning, yep. when they finally figured out how they could get neural networks to actually do really useful things if you throw a lot of data at it, a lot of computing power. But the third wave are really cognitive architectures. So your starting point on the third wave is what does intelligence require? And, you know, some of the things I mentioned earlier, that you need to have instantaneous learning, you need to have reasoning, but these need to be integrated. You can't just take a deep learning system and put, you know, good old fashioned AI on top of it. I mean, how do you even integrate them? You know, and yeah. it, it, the deep learning system still can't learn interactively in real time. So you really need to throw that all away and, and, and start with what do you require and build a cognitive architecture that is designed specifically to meet the requirements of intelligence. Fascinating. That is fascinating. I can't wait to, uh, uh, I can't wait to get to a world where it's a little bit more like that than the madness we're in right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Peter, one thing is like, and we, we touched briefly on this, like the ethics of AI, right, in general. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of hype, and there's a lot of tools with MLOps and other things that yeah. are helping you solve for ethics. But the big question in ethics has always been, who's ethics, right? I mean, what is the right code of ethics? How should a system behave versus not, right? What, what, how do you see the state of the enterprise today with AI and with the ethics of AI, if you will? Yeah, so... Uh, you know, again, a lot of the stuff is driven by funding and what you can, sure. what you can get, um, you know, published and and what you know you can do a PhD on and so on. So it's a lot of the stuff is sort of what's fashionable. So if you can jump on the uh, AI ethics bandwagon, and you know, what is it? Bias is a is a, is a big thing, but you know that's really no different from any other system. It's not unique to to AI at all. I mean, whether you have expert systems or whether pr- previously you had humans, you know, for example, loan applications. I mean, a loan application at the bank, the bank had its own set of rules and those rules had biases in them, even if those rules were written on a piece of paper, you know, or passed on verbally. Um, you know, bias in face recognition or whatever, that the system isn't as good at at recognizing certain types of faces versus others. It's a pure engineering and market problem. You know, a company clearly is going to develop the market for who's buying their product. And if, if the product works in that market, then they can charge for it. If it doesn't work in that market, they, you know, they're going to lose out. So, it's it's purely a sort of an engineering problem or an, a, a mundane uh, ethics problem. I'm not saying it's not important, sure, but it has nothing specifically to do with AI. 
it's just, again, you can get funding if you could, you know, we're working on AI ethics and we're going to have this whole list of AI ethics things, you know, and, you know, autonomous um, soldiers or, you know, autonomous guns. Well, would you rather have your son get killed in a conflict or would you rather have a machine being shot up? Yeah. You know, and in any case, you can talk about it till the cows come home. You know, if 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 the if your enemy has a drone that is weaponized, are you going to say, well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to shoot the dr drone out of the sky or the operator of the drone uh, with another drone? Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of sort of just, yeah, ethics washing or, or whatever, you know, just make people feel yeah. good or get funding on it. But really the problems are, uh, um, you know, as I say, yes, let's get rid of bias where we shouldn't have bias and let's do things that are good for humanity. But it really doesn't have a lot to do with AI in particular. That is awesome. No, you're, you're so right. I think, you know, the interesting um, paddle I see is, well, not a paddle, but more like the, 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 the overarching theme I see is there is a lot of um, human societal challenges that are now we are seeing through the reflection of or through the lenses of technology. And that's causing mm -hmm. a lot of these debates and stuff, which is, I mean, don't take me wrong. It's amazing that we are having that. But as you said, those are, I mean, those are, yeah, those are problems that need to be solved, but there are also bigger problems that we need to actually start really looking yeah. at for which you need yeah. AI to help you solve those, right? Yeah, no, I think I, I think that's a good way of putting it, you know, that it's through the lens of, of technology, but let's not blame the technology, you know. Of course um, not, right? You know, uh, technology is a leverage yeah. mechanism. It just amplifies, right. you know, what we already do, right? And and so this is this has been right. fascinating. Very different perspective, Peter. I think, you know, really appreciate you spending the time. Mm. Uh, give me your what do you what do you expect? We are still early in twenty twenty two. Give me some predictions for the year. What do you want? What do you see? What do you expect to see? And what do you want to see in AI uh, this year? Um, I would like to finally see a shift to the third wave of, of AI uh, that more people start working on AGI, on, on real AI, because uh, everybody's working on narrow AI. All the money is going there. Um, in fact, I have a, an anecdote there. We had a brilliant intern from Germany work for, uh, with us for a year, and he totally understood the AGI paradigm, cognitive architectures, and so on. Um, he went back to Germany to uh, do his PhD. He couldn't get a sponsor for any of this. So he ended up doing his PhD in deep learning, machine learning. Another person lost to the cause, basically. You know, I mean, where is he going to work now? Is he works at a professor? It's going to be obviously what he still spent the last seven years doing, you know. Um, and so, you know, I think we need more people to to stand back and say, what do we really need for, to have an intelligent system? And once they ask that question properly, okay. then they will say, well, no point in putting more effort into big data, machine learning, deep learning systems the way we're doing now. It's a waste of time, you know, and good old fashioned AI, we also know is not the right path. But what have we learned from that to build a cognitive architecture, uh, the third wave AI? So that's that's what I'm hoping for. And I'm, I'm trying to organize some uh, interest in in that because we really do want these more intelligent systems, you know, for the reasons we spoke about earlier. So in the meantime, for ourselves, we're chipping away at it, uh, yeah. trying to grow our company as quickly as we can so that we can, um, you know, have more of our people work work on ongoing development to raise the IQ of our system. We believe we have the right platform, the right approach. We just need, you know, there's a lot of work yeah. to be done to crank up the IQ. You know, it's it's uh, no, it's fascinating. I think that you're you're there's some um, I would say I, while I don't hundred percent agree with everything you were saying in terms of the, how you mm -hmm. see the world, which is very unique, by the way. And I still appreciate that that the the end goal. I think we're all driving towards the same end goal. Um, and I think the, the couple of things I'm taking away from this conversation is one, everybody's definition of AGI itself is wrong. We need to actually reframe it, rephrase it in the way you defined it. I think that'll be that itself will open up because the first time you say AGI, people are going to think about open AI's open letter to everybody saying how AGI is so bad and you have to be able to start taking control of AGI, right? So there is that. 
On the other side, like to your point on how we have moved from GoFi to the wave two, which is more data-driven machine learning, deep learning, to now going into cognitive architectures, I think all of these will compound, right? I mean, the, what we got from symbolic logic and GoFi was the whole rules-based system where you can capture knowledge of simple rules, right? I mean, in Austin, we have the Psych Project, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, with Doug Lanat here, right? I mean, they've been doing that for, for, for decades now, right? Multiple decades. So that's on one hand. On the deep learning side, I mean, uh, even though like the transformer architecture, for example, that came out in the last two years, right? It's while it is where it is right now, but the the opportunity of taking that kind of an architecture in deep learning and applying to multitask, generalized kind of tasks across multiple tasks with the same model, improving efficiency of actually doing that. You don't have to burn, you know, 1.7 billion parameters to actually train a model anymore. So all of that, I think, is going to compound towards getting to the future that you're defining, which is more driven through cognitive architectures, where you take the best of all of this, and then we actually set up in a world where you're building true systems that are truly intelligent, that can reason, that can interact, and that can learn from those interactions, right? Um, fascinating. I think that I like to always say mm-hmm. that the, the world is, um, you know, it, we're, we're all going to, to a place where it's going to be so bright that we all will need shades. To, it's a, it just, uh, I'm such a uh, technology optimist in the future. Peter, mm-hmm. uh, where can the um, listeners and viewers get in touch with you? How can they, how can they find you on the internet? Yeah, very easy. Uh, I mean, I'm on um, uh, Twitter and Facebook, but probably the easiest is to uh, just, you can email me, peter at igo.ai, website, igo.ai. And my articles are linked from the website, but also on medium.com, Peter yep. Voss. So very easy to get hold of me, LinkedIn or wherever. Awesome. And I'd love to talk to, to people who are really interested in the direct path to AGI and not trying to torturously continue on deep learning, machine learning, or good old fashioned AI that might eventually end up, you know, with the right architecture, but rather to, 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 you know, start more with a clean slate and say, how can we get to AGI, you know, directly? What do we need to do? And uh, I'd, I'd love to have more of a community, more people uh, working on that. Involved no, definitely, Peter, you represent a very unique school of thought in the entire spectrum right now. So uh, good luck to that efforts. And I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure the viewers and listeners will get a very refreshing, very different perspective on these topics as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. It was a blast. Great. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you.